During the last few years, I've been mostly focusing on how can I build a system that predicts events. One of the many things we do as data scientists is find correlations in data. One of the first things we started doing at Microsoft many years ago is trying to identify adverse drug effects. The way it's being done today, you take 300 people, maybe 400 people, you give them the drugs, and you see how they react. What we thought is, how can we use big data in order to identify effects that nobody still knows? How can we mine millions of people's reaction to drugs? So what we decided is to take the search engine and look on what people are searching for. So if somebody was searching for a certain medicine, and then just a few days afterwards was searching for a side effect, then if you have another person looking for the same medicine and same side effect approximately in the same time, then another, then another, then another, we would align the data and identify new side effects that were never known before. One of the examples is, is the effects for Epixor. It was known that Epixor causes both sleepiness and nausea, but using the, these type of algorithms, it was also very interesting to identify exactly when. It turns out that in the very first days, you feel nausea, but in the last two weeks afterwards, you start feeling sleepiness. Another company that was trying to apply big data in health, and you all know it, is Google. They had the following idea. If you're searching for the word flu, you probably have a flu. And if many people are searching for this word, you probably have an epidemic. You're laughing, but this is a really well-known nature paper. They actually show that they were able to predict flu outbreaks almost two to three weeks in advance before any of the HMOs could ever know it. Until one day, it stopped working. It even got published in Nature as when Google got flu wrong. So one day when people were searching for flu, they stopped having the flu. If you're trying to think exactly about what was going on here, is the reason is swine flu. It turns out that people were searching for flu not because they had the flu, but because they were thinking they have a swine flu, they were reading about this in the news. And this is a lot of the problems that we have in identifying correlations and somehow inferring based on them on causality. A very well-known example was also happening in the beginning of the 1900s. Polio disease is a very disease that children have. And at one point of time, they believed that children who are having ice cream have higher probability of having the disease. They checked all their data, and indeed, children eating ice cream had higher probability. But when they stopped the kids from having ice cream, it didn't affect anything. So what's the correlation? What's between ice cream and polio? What's even the connection? So it turns out it's summer. Kids just had more polio during summer. And this is where I realize is that if we want to get to really good predictions and understand how reality works, we cannot just look at correlations in the data. We actually need to understand causality. We as humans have causality all the time and understand it because we have experience with the world. We do some interaction, we see what happens. And what I was thinking, can we take everything humanity knows about causality from the experience you have and give it to an artificial intelligence system? And eventually, what I did is took 150 years of news articles, billions of tweets, millions of web searches. The algorithm worked in the following way. It took sentences. So in this example, this is a real one. US Army bombs a weapon warehouse in Kabul with missiles. It identifies who did the action, US Army, the action bombing that was performed on weapon warehouse in Kabul with missiles. It would then look for cues in the data. Somebody said, this causes, this happens after. So in this case, this caused five Afghan troops to be killed. Behind the scene, we created a causality graph of 300 million nodes and billions of edges representing what humanity knows in the last 150 years about causality. At this time, I was working uh, with the Chaos Foundation in the UN. We were trying to predict disease outbreaks, riots, but they were mostly focused on one specific outbreak, the Ebola outbreak. 
They asked us not to predict it because it already happened, but instead, can we maybe explain it? Again, we're data scientists, we, are, we like large data, and uh, I think one of the saddest things one of the scientists said, well, unfortunately, we didn't have enough Ebola cases in the past. <laughs> so in humans, we didn't have enough Ebola cases, but in animals, we did have a few dozens. And it turns out all of them have a simple pattern. And what I like about this story, it sounds like a biblical story, because it turns out that Ebola starts because of human greed. So in April 1975, this is the beginning of the pattern. I'm talking about uh, the Zairean Ebola. The system identified that some news article was writing about diamonds and gold. It knows that when people are searching for diamonds and gold, deforestation is going to happen. If deforestation happens, then animals might migrate. And specifically, a certain type of animal, the bat. And indeed, this is a discovery we did a few weeks before the identification of patient zero, a three-year-old child who ate an uncooked bad bush meat. Now, what we decided is to take this type of system of causality and try to apply it to also predict future outbreaks. We're working on cholera, so cholera is a waterborne disease, so we already knew from the causality graph that storms might cause cholera. But of course, we all know that not all storms cause cholera. So what we started doing is building an algorithm that looks for correlations with what's so special about those storms that cause the cholera. And the algorithm identified the following thing, is that in two years before that, the news reported about a drought in this area, the probability of those storms causing cholera is extremely higher. This was based just on a few cases in Angola since 2006. But in Bangladesh, since 1960, 19 significant cases of cholera. In 84% of them, we had exactly this pattern. But this pattern doesn't happen in Israel, in Germany, in the States. So what's so special about Angola and Bangladesh? Why there? Why not in other locations? Usually people think, well, this is poor countries, right? I'm going to ask you a simple question. How do you know that they are poor countries? What did you read about it? Who told you that? We as humans have so much world knowledge that we obtain through our lives that we don't even know where it came from. So how can a system predict if it doesn't know to generalize the way we humans do. So what we did, we gave the system access to word knowledge, to encyclopedias and hundreds of different data sets. One example of those was Wikipedia. And we let the system think about hypothesis. It was thinking maybe this is happening because of the ethnic groups in those locations, maybe population density, maybe government types. And then it only found out two elements. If the GDP of those countries is not high, the probability of this pattern is higher. Again, probably poor countries, don't have sewage systems. But what's really surprising is that it identified that they all have low percentage of water. And this is surprising for me, especially as cholera is a waterborne disease. In 2011, a system started alerting about the cholera outbreak in Cuba. Now, Cuba didn't have a cholera outbreak in 130 years, so to be honest, we didn't put a lot of attention on this specific alert. But in August 2012, our system reads the following article about tropical storms swiping Cuba, and it gives a much higher probability of cholera in the next three months. And indeed, in January 2013, the first cholera outbreak in 130 years happens in Cuba. Cholera is a disease that kills 100,000 people every year. But it's very simple to treat. If you send clean water in time, mortality rates drop from 50% to less than 1%. So what we started doing with the different organizations is actually supplying them those type of systems that look at weather data and try to alert a few months in advance before a cholera outbreak happens so that it can actually deliver water in time. Now, our system wasn't very focused on only diseases. We were working with doctors and certain organizations that were interested in those. Uh, the UN was really interested in predicting riots. So we didn't predict the Arab Spring, that was harder, but we did predict the riots in Sudan. The pattern the system found is the following one. 
If you have a subsidized product, so for example, in Egypt in the past this was bread, and you stop subsidizing it, you can have student riots. If one of the students gets killed by the police, you're going to have a much larger riots happening in this country. So this is exactly what was going on in Sudan. Sudan had gas subsidized. They stopped subsidizing it one day. Young people went to the streets. One of them got killed, and then huge riots went through all the country. Again, all of this happened in just a few weeks. Now, this pattern is very unique to countries like Sudan and Egypt. But what's in common between Sudan and Egypt? Why it doesn't happen in Israel, it doesn't happen in the States? So our algorithm identified the following pattern. It turns out that those countries are actually getting richer in the last four years, so their income is higher, but the average salary is not going up. So where the money goes? Another thing we were actually investigating is genocides. It turns out that after World War II, there were 13 different genocides. The definition of the UN is a murder of 10,000 people and more. And what they wanted to understand is what identifies, what happens almost three to four or five years before so they can actually try to prevent it via education. So what our system identified is the following pattern. If you have somebody important in this country, or the way our algorithm says, somebody who has a Wikipedia page, and he calls a minority in that country in one of the following two words, only two mice or cockroaches, the probability of a genocide quadruples in the next three years. And the reason for this, this is when we were talking to sociologists that were saying, yes, this is one of the steps of dehumanization in order for a genocide to happen. And the last few years, I was thinking, how can I leverage all these techniques to build a system that makes breakthroughs in medicine? The idea, I don't think about the system I was building as a system that predicts the future. I think about it as a system that thinks about hypothesis. As a researcher, you think about one hypothesis, and then you test it for many years. If it works, great, you get a Nobel Prize, you get a paper. But that's super hard especially if the hypothesis doesn't work. This is why drug discovery is such a hard task. What I was hoping to do is build an artificial intelligence system who's going to replace me. It's going to think about very creative ideas, look at statistical significance in the last few years, and then only the ones that have higher probability, this is the one that she's going to suggest for us to do clinical trials in. What I was doing in the last two years, I've been working with one of the largest HMOs here in Israel. We have access to 4 million patients' data for the last 20 years. We have their lab tests, doctor visits, prescriptions. And one of the main things we were asked to do is the following. It turns out that there is Moore's Law that says that technology is going to get smaller, cheaper every year. Uh, and indeed, this prediction was really good. In medicine, we have something we call earroom law. This is the word more written the other way. It says that every year developing a new drug is going to take twice the amount of time, twice the amount of money, and in general, we just run out of ideas for new drugs. And what we're thinking, instead of maybe creating a new drug, maybe there are good drugs today that can be applied to different diseases. This is called drug repositioning. Today, the way it's done, they take a drug and then systematically check it on many people. I'm asking, why do experiments if for 20 years people of Israel have been doing experiments on themselves? Can we mine this and identify new drugs for other diseases? And what we identified is actually thousands of different drugs that can be repositioned. We started with hypertension, diabetes. This is one of the more expensive diseases here in Israel and in the West. And for hypertension, we identified the few new ones that can be reused. We didn't stop at that point. It turns out that different people react to different treatments in different ways. So what we were trying to do is even to identify for each person based on their history, their family history, without their DNA, what is the right drugs for them to use? We also tried to identify maybe some of those drugs which are super popular, maybe some of them have negative effects as well. And one of our main discoveries, and this is something that we're uh, today checking in the lab, it seems that one of the most popular drugs used in the States, for example, uh, 20, by 25% of the population above the age of 50, is actually causing Parkinson's disease or increasing it by 30%. 
And this is insane. This is a drug everybody's using, but still nobody was doing the science behind it to identify its effects. We decided to take it to the next level as well. If we can use already existing drugs, can we use machine learning techniques to create new ones as well? So what we did, we used a machine learning system that generates molecules. It generates them from scratch using existing drugs as a beginning point. And what we've seen in our experiments is that if our system was used in, in 1936, we would have discovered the drug number one for tuberculosis. In general, a system generated thousands of molecules, out of which 40, uh, 45 are already known drugs. And this gives us the potential to actually go and synthesize some of them with higher probability of being affecting a good target. One of the main things that actually disturbed me when I was doing all this experiment is that I identified that our body doesn't have a similar. Think about it, if we have an airplane, every time we want to test something new in the airplane, we would say, okay, just take 300 people, fly with it. If it falls, well, okay, maybe this is not a good change. It's just insane that this is the way drugs and medicine works today. We're doing experiments on ourselves because we do not know how to simulate our body. But some of doctors do know this. If you think about it, we built a system that looks at millions of people. So it has the experience the doctor has, but it didn't go to medical school. It didn't read all the articles he did, it didn't read the books. So what we decided to do is build a system that reads the books. So in this case, it actually receives a sentence. For example, insulin causes liver to convert more glucose into glycogen. It actually identifies the different words and builds a small simulator that we can then run. So for example, it knows that when you have more glucose, eventually it's gonna cause several events that's gonna decrease the blood uh, sugar level. In the last uh, few years, because I've been working many times in the hospitals, I've seen something that actually disturbed me a lot. I've seen the situation in the emergency rooms. People are waiting more than three hours for something that is as simple as a differential diagnosis. Doctor spends around a minute with a person and says, well, this is approximately what you have. You go to this department. This is, you go to another department. You go out of the hospital. Why do people need to wait five, eight hours and now with, for one minute of a doctor that have higher probability of making a mistake? 50% of the mistakes in the ER are diagnostic mistakes. And all of the doctors, the way they're working is they just see many patients, maybe hundreds of patients, so they're biased and they know approximately what to ask, and based on this, they understand what you have. Look at a bit of the vital signs, blood tests, maybe if they have time on the history, but how many things can you do in one to 10 minutes? So what we decided is to go to a country project that's gonna automate ERs. They don't have to be in the hospital, they can be outside the hospital. And what we're building is a robotic and sensoric system. The system is actually taking many of the vital signs the doctors are seeing, from blood saturation based on touching the person, to looking with computer vision on the face of the person, looking whether they're pale or not, taking their weight, all of this in half a minute. After this, the system looks at millions of people that we have in our database and looks exactly what type of diagnosis this person needs to get. Based on this, the different doctors, the head of the ER is getting alerts. This is an important person. We think he has this. This is another person. We have to send them to this check. In some of the hospitals, they even approved us to automatically send them to tests. And what we believe is that we need to make sure that the diagnosis is something that is approachable for everybody. Everybody on this planet should get the same diagnosis as people in Stanford or one of the hospitals here in Israel without the need to travel or wait for eight hours. And this is what I think our future holds. A huge automation of the way we do science, a huge automation about how we give care. Thank you so much.